Um, this is a long overdue conversation. A lot of you have asked us to cover male infertility. We have an amazing urologist right now who is going to be joining us in just a moment. And it's going to be, it's going to be a fun, provocative conversation. You know, we do a lot of talks where we try to break down, um, break, break down barriers to chat, uh, break down barriers to reproductive health, barriers for women, barriers for men. And I think that it is one of those things where we just really need to talk about men's reproductive health, especially this year with the pandemic. Um, some of the research that Dr. Spitz has seen has really shown that, um, that even stress and just the pandemic itself has led to um, men really struggling with erectile dysfunction this year. We're just going to make sure that he can get on. Give us one quick minute. Everybody hang in there. Oh, we did it. Okay, yay. everybody, first of all, yay, we did it, we did it. Okay, turning down the Zoom. All right, and we got some good questions coming in. I'm going to dive into a couple of these questions, Dr. Spitz, before we even get to backtrack to some other things because we have a couple of awesome questions. First, okay. is IVF necessary for a couple whose husband has abnormal morphology? Um, IVF may not be necessary for uh, abnormal morphology. It is um, – usually the case that morphology is sort of the least predictive of how fertile the sperm is. It's a really um, kind of a soft variable. I've had many couples where the only problem is abnormal morphology, and by the time they get in to see me, they're already pregnant naturally. Um, but great. if the morphology is severely low, it may in fact reflect a problem with sperm quality that IVF can overcome. But in many cases, the morphology in and of itself, if the other numbers are okay for IUI, say, or natural conception, um, is not, is not uh, reliably um, showing that the sperm will not work. Okay, that's really helpful. Do plant-based diets improve morphology? Uh, plant-based diets probably do. There is not a study that isolated that out, but I would say that there is uh, evidence because a study out of Harvard several years ago showed that men who ate the most plants in their diet had the best quality sperm, which included morphology, as well as motility and concentration. So I think it's fair to say that uh, if you're trying to improve your morphology, a plant-based diet has the potential to do that. That's incredible. Okay, Danny, I hope, hopefully that gave you a little bit of hope. So get your man to eat his veggies. I know it's hard, but... Uh... I, I try to just add arugula to every meal. I love arugula. <laughs> so I just try to add it to every meal. It's my like, right. little cheat. <laughs> All right, Bruna, um, not, she's not sure on the correct medical terms, but her husband's his sperm is good in quantity but not on speed. So they were told that ICSI was the right option, but if she just did an IUI, wouldn't that help bypass the speed issue? Well, um, the motility of the sperm is important for IUI, and if the sperm is exceptionally sluggish, then it may not uh, swim to the egg effectively, even if it's inseminated near the egg. Wow. But, um, but if the sperm uh, motility is sort of in the moderate range, uh, I think that IUI still uh, has a reasonable potential. But with IUI, the sperm still has to get to the egg and penetrate it. With ICSI, even if the sperm isn't moving at all, as long as it is alive, it is injected directly into the egg, which bypasses that hurdle of getting to the egg and penetrating the egg. Right. So, Bruna, definitely a little bit of hope there. Also, kind of same question, do plant-based diets maybe speed them up a little bit if they're not, help, if they're not sluggish from too many carbs? Yes. Yeah, so, again, the evidence shows that guys who eat more vegetables and fruits have – better motility, better swimming sperm, faster swimming sperm. Okay. Now, is it true, too, that um, gender kind of influences that as well? The, the male sperm tend to be faster swimmers, but the, the female sperm tend to have more endurance. Is that true or is that a myth? <laughs> um, I think that there may be some truth to that. I've heard that as well, but I don't know that I've actually <laughs> read any peer-reviewed scientific journal articles about it. However, um, you know, it is something that you, you tend to hear uh, thrown around. Not that it matters all that much, right? right. Because it's not like you're going to be able to pick and choose which of your sperm hits the egg. Um, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Seckhorn joined too. Um, let's see. 
Um, all right. There was another question that came into the Q&A little channel. How long does it take? Well, this is, this is, I'm seeing a question, but this is not a Dr. Spitz question, but I'll ask the question anyway. How long does it take to see period after hysteroscopy surgery? So Dr. Spitz is a urologist. He deals with men and not uteruses, but he might know the answer. I don't. <laughs> okay, so let's get to some more. Let's actually talk about the book for a second. Um, I love the book title. Why, in this day and age, is it still so difficult for people to talk about the penis and talk about the vagina without getting, like, embarrassed and, and flushed? Is it just in the U.S. That, that it's difficult to talk about these things, or is it everywhere? Well, I think the United States does tend to be a bit more conservative when it comes to sex in kind of a paradoxical way. I mean, certainly, uh, you know, where I live here in Southern California is one of the pornography capitals of the world. But, you know, I think our origins uh, dating back to uh, the Puritan pilgrims, uh, you know, run deep. And um, social conservative values and uh, social conservative, um, you know, perspectives really uh, are pervasive. I think they're pervasive as we grow up as children into adulthood and we pass them on to our children. And in this culture in the United States, it's still rather taboo to talk about these things unless you're doing it in a joking way right. uh, or unless, unless, oddly enough, you know, it's admixed with violence. But to really mm -hmm. have an honest, open conversation using those words in the mainstream media is uh, uncommon. Uh, and, and uncomfortable mm -hmm. still. You know, it is. And I'll tell you, I years ago I had the opportunity to co-produce a video-based oncofertility course. And when I got to the theme, you know, we often talk about misinformation, lack of access to education, lack of information for, um, for, for female health. But the, the truth of the matter was I found lots of information I could weave into this oncofertility course I did. I found nothing, and I mean no resources for men. No, re no resources for young men. And I have a son who's seven. He's grown up around these words. He's grown up around these, these terms. He goes to all the reproductive conferences when they were in person. He sees models of uteruses and penises, you know, and things like that. So I've been very open with him, but I was so shocked. Is that, you know, what was your motivation for writing this book? Is it well, really for that reason? Uh, it's, it's largely for that reason. You know, I have appeared uh, many times on television. Uh, on a show called The Doctors primarily, to talk about the penis. Uh, and it's always uh, couched in uh, the, the sort of uh, title of, you know, TMI Tuesday, Too Much Information Tuesday, or, or what's, you know, what's your most embarrassing sex question? You know, right. it's always couched in this idea of, ooh, it's salacious, it's, uh, it's hidden. But then when we do this, the topic, mm -hmm. we always would reinforce, hey, look, this, this shouldn't be hidden. Yeah. This shouldn't be embarrassing. Um, exactly. this, sh this shouldn't be something that, you know, you have to hide. And after doing many shows like that, it occurred to me that this kind of demystification and good, solid information is valuable and people uh, are still needing access to it. It's not something that people just naturally find and when I encounter my patients in my practice, I am very sensitive to how much misinformation they may come in with and how much education they may be lacking. And so when I wrote this book, I sort of looked at it like a, a blend between maybe a written extended, uh, uh, extended version of a doctor's segment, very extended version, Coupled with, what if I could sit down and spend a three-day weekend with one of my patients and tell them everything I would like them to know? And that's sort of the, 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 uh, the result of this book. And I did it with some humor so that people could uh, enjoy it and not, you know, fall asleep immediately. Oh, I think it's fantastic. Um, it is. And, and, it's I, and I, yeah, and, and it's just fun. a style, style yeah. that I think makes it more accessible. Because it's not that I'm making fun of the penis by any means, but I think if we can look at ourselves with, say, a lighthearted perspective rather yeah. than a fearful or an embarrassed perspective, then we can learn more and we can also, um, I think, be more healthy, more functional, uh, yeah. more confident. Well, absolutely. And, and if, there's so many directions I want to go in this conversation. You know, when, when you think about the pandemic this year and the stress level on men, right, how does that typically manifest itself in 
an erection in their ability to quote unquote perform. I almost hate even calling it perform because that yeah. in itself like sets you up for failure or success, which is really not what we're trying to achieve, right? Right, right. Well, you know, um, the pandemic has introduced a lot of stress into people's lives. And stress causes the body to release adrenaline. And adrenaline is a chemical that prepares us to handle life-threatening stress because what it does is it shunts the blood away from our arms, legs, uh, fingers, and toes, less, less critical parts of our body to our heart, mm -hmm. lungs, brain. And that way, if the worst case happens and, say, uh, you know, we are physically injured, our, our arm is ripped off, uh, mm -hmm. we lose a limb, we're not going to bleed to death. We're going to survive that better. But, yeah. but that stress response that adrenaline gives to our body also pulls blood away from our penis mm. to our heart and lungs. So the stress from COVID, from the pandemic, or from other life stressors even before the pandemic can cause erectile dysfunction because the adrenaline that's in your body when you're feeling stress takes blood away from your penis, making it harder for you to get an erection or harder for you to keep an erection. Got it. Lots of guys have performance anxiety due to low levels of stress around the question in their head, I wonder if I'm going to have trouble getting an erection. Just right. that question alone can give them trouble having an erection because that question triggers them to release a little bit of adrenaline, mm. which then makes it hard for them to get an erection. And then the next time they go to have sex, they say, I wonder if I'm going to have trouble getting an erection again like that last time. Wow. Boom. Adrenaline release, decreased flow to the penis, negative reinforcement. And that can happen over and over again. You add the baseline increase in adrenaline that men are experiencing due to the stress of the pandemic, maybe they lost their job. Maybe they or one right. of their family members is sick. Uh, maybe they're worried about eviction, uh, putting food on the table, or just general fear from all the media that's we're constantly fear broadcasting fear. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, my gosh, we're surrounded by fear messages. Fear. And so, you're, so this guy's baseline level of adrenaline is already jacked up. Then he has difficulty having an erection, and then he has that negative feedback loop set in that performance right. anxiety, and everything is accentuated. Oh, my gosh. And then I'm thinking about the female side, and what do we do immediately? We, we, you don't love me anymore. You don't find me attractive anymore. Exactly. I'm no longer sexy. And so yeah. there's this, like, double, like, stress on the whole couple when it's really, it's a physiological thing. And right. What are your, like, start with, with like, the low-tech solution options all the way to the high-tech solution options for knowing that it's coming from a, from stress. I mean, I exercise every single day to, do, to cope with my stress, often yeah. not enough. <laughs> you know, I might reach for that bourbon at the end of the day, but <laughs> <laughs> I might, I might. But, you know, I, I'm religious about, about exercise because I, I, I know too much about the physiological impact of stress on the body. Right. right. So, you know, but what are what are some from like even psychological solutions? What are some of those kind of immediate things that you talk to your patients about to help them cope with stress, to deal with erectile dysfunction, all the way up to medical options for that? Sure. So specifically regarding performance anxiety, uh, when a man understands what's actually causing performance anxiety, that his body is releasing adrenaline when he has this concern about his erection and the adrenaline is stopping the flow of blood to the penis. Just that knowledge alone can go a long way mm -hmm. to taking it down a notch because many men, when they are dealing with performance anxiety, not aware of what the mechanism is, really wonder if there's something physically wrong with them, if they're mm -hmm. somehow broken, uh, if, this, wow. you know, if this is a new permanent change, and that is extremely stressful. Just understanding what the underlying mechanism and how simple it is can give many men an aha moment, and then they can actually stop being subject to this vicious cycle of this negative feedback loop. Right. So that's the first step is knowledge, understanding why this happens and how this happens. And also for the partner, because if the, if the guy's partner is um, giving the guy even more stress because now the guy has to reassure his partner that it's not her, that he's not having an affair, right. that he's still interested, that she still looks good in those genes, whatever it is, exactly. all of that stress now goes away if she understands what the mechanism is too. Mm -hmm. And so that's the beginning point is, is understanding why and how and then taking everything down a notch because now you're getting real. You're just dealing with the reality of the biology and you're dispelling all the anxieties that, 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 that are unfounded. Now, beyond that, um, 
uh, behavioral medicine specialists are really key in helping men with performance anxiety mm. because just knowing how it works isn't necessarily enough for many guys. Right. It's very hard to tell yourself, stop thinking that. Stop thinking, I oh, wonder yeah. if I'm going to have trouble. You say stop, you're it's all you think about. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So what a behavioral medicine specialist will do is uh, they will tell a guy uh, techniques about how to perceive sex uh, just in general, how to perceive intimacy, uh, and how to take it down a notch in that way. So, for example, uh, one, one strategy is uh, men look at sex uh, quite often as a performance um, and as a goal-oriented uh, event. There's a beginning, there's a middle, and there's an end, and it requires an erection to take you from A to Z, and the erection has to be a certain firmness or better, et cetera, et cetera. And that, uh, that concept of what sex is to a guy already is laden with, um, you know, uh, metrics and... and yeah, right. um, Like I said, success failure, yeah, right? I mean, right. It, it, Finish it, lines. Right. right. So a sex therapist will often advise a guy, hey, why don't you look at sex as something that's very pleasurable for you, that doesn't necessarily have a, a defined beginning or a defined end, mm -hmm. that may or may not involve penetrative intercourse, um, that may or may not involve reaching climax, uh, and play around with it and change your, change your concept of what the guy's role is. You're not a yeah. robot who shows up and does a certain number of thrusts and right. completes a task. Uh, and this is, wow. um, and it's a different way to view it. Right? Like in infertility oh. cases when it's like scheduled and you oh, got, yeah. no, I'm ready, I'm ovulating. And it's like, now you got to show up. I mean, there's, I, yeah. I can't sex even on imagine. Demand. Totally right. sex on demand. But and, I, love, and, I love what you're talking about so much, like yeah. putting intimacy back into sexuality. And also, and also taking away the expectations that guys impose on themselves. And the other thing right. that guys uh, often don't realize is that uh, their partner doesn't necessarily expect sex as often or as uh, intense uh, as they mm -hmm. think they do. And right. guys may be concerned that their partner is um, disappointed because it's not happening the same way or the same frequency, et cetera. And, in fact, the expectation is overblown, and it's putting additional unneeded stress on them. And right. so it's okay to have intimacy without sex sometimes. It's okay to have sex without orgasm sometimes. Right. Um, and, and these are things to just play around with till you sort of get, you know, back back to your old self. There's nothing wrong with sex the way you, you, you do it now. There's nothing wrong with the goal-oriented sex, but mm -hmm. it can become a problem. And when it becomes a problem, it's time to pivot, maybe temporarily, or, okay. maybe, or maybe incorporating the pivot, you know, in, in, into the new normal. But I have so many couples who are facing infertility where the guy is suffering from performance anxiety because of that sex-on-demand nature. Yeah. Uh, and, um, and so then uh, that takes us to, let me just jump ahead to some medical interventions because sometimes right. medical interventions are really useful. And by that I mean oral medications like mm -hmm. the pills we've heard of, Viagra, Cialis, Stendril, you know, there's a whole list. And then the generics very commonly for Viagra, Sildenafil, mm -hmm. the generic for Cialis, Tadalafil. These are now um, much more affordable. And the good news about these medications is that they are effective for performance anxiety because while adrenaline decreases the flow of blood to the penis, these pills increase the flow of blood to the mm -hmm. penis, and they usually can increase the flow of blood more powerfully than adrenaline is decreasing it. So they usually win that battle. Ah, gotcha. And the nice thing is, is that then they give the guy positive feedback, and after a while of using them, they may be able to take that adrenaline fear uh, response down a notch because, A, they know the pill has their back, and, B, they've had positive experiences, and they may be able to then stop the pill and just sort of fly, fly solo again, uh, kind of back to normal. Now, the ideal is coupling the medications with behavioral therapy, Right. Um, to sort of really uh, reach a sustainable uh, remedy, a sustainable improvement. But those pills are very effective, and they really can save the day for infertile couples where they really do need to try to ovulate on demand at a certain time during the yeah. ovulation. I mean, uh, have intercourse, I'm sorry, exactly. not ovulate. Have intercourse during yeah. ovulation at a particular time, uh, and they can allow a man to, um, to rise to the occasion and also, you know, as men get older, they have a longer refractory period. 
and it becomes difficult to have sex as frequently. And for uh, men who are on the older end of the age spectrum trying to initiate a pregnancy, these pills can be helpful having sex that second or third time that week, whereas they may not naturally um, be able to as easily because men's refractory periods will start to lengthen in their 40s, 50s, even in their, in their 30s. Uh, men have sex less frequently than their 20s. Right. Uh, and, and these pills can help with that, but they're not harming the body. And they are not harming the sperm. They're not having a negative impact on fertility. The only risk with these pills is typically if a man is also taking nitroglycerin for uh, heart disease um, because then the synergy of the two can bottom out the pressure of blood flowing through the heart and, and actually cause you know, a heart attack. But barring that combination, these pills are very safe. They should be taken under the supervision of a doctor by a doctor's prescription but they are safe and they don't have a negative impact on fertility. Okay, this is also incredibly helpful. I have 100 questions, but we have some other others with questions too. So Danny's kind of clarifying, and, and you know, a lot of times, um, and this is sort of heartbreaking, Dr. Spitz, but we don't always, uh, we, we, we see in our community that they get a lot of bad medical advice and at their primary care level or with kind of a generalist. And, you know, this, this case in particular um, Danny has been doing Clomid cycles, but not necessarily coupled with IUI. And if you know that your partner has a morphology issue, you know, wouldn't you at least recommend if they were going to go through a Clomid cycle that it would be Clomid coupled with IUI? Just to see? Well, again, uh, I don't know if, if you may have heard me comment earlier that morphology is the least predictive of the parameters. So people can be normally fertile, uh, with an abnormal morphology mm -hmm. if the motility and the, uh, and the concentration are adequate. And so IUI is not necessarily going to change the fertility outcome because of the morphology, but it does increase yeah. the chance of fertility in general across the board. So you could take the approach, well, if I'm going to take Clomid, I want to, I want to maximize all my parameters, I want to do IUI too. On the other hand, it's certainly reasonable that if the issue is ovulation and Clomid is fixing that, but the sperm is normal except for the morphology, it may be normal anyway, uh -huh. and, and it may work with natural conception. For me, a, a test that I look at that I think has more of a predictive value of whether or not your sperm is, is likely to work with natural conception or with IUI as opposed to needing in vitro fertility is a test called DNA fragmentation. Okay. This is a test that looks at how well the DNA of the sperm is packaged up for delivery into the egg. And if that packaging is very fragmented, it tends to not ultimately result in successful pregnancies. Now, it's not a test that predicts for birth defects. It's not about that kind of DNA fragmentation. It's just about these sperm are there in large numbers. They're swimming around. Their morphology may be good. It may not be good. But how is the quality. What's the likelihood that this is going to work with natural sex or with insemination? What's the likelihood that if I get the sperm somewhere near the egg, it's going to be able to do its job? And DNA right. fragmentation is a much better predictor of that than morphology is. So, for example, if a person has a low morphology but their DNA fragmentation is normal and their other counts are okay, they have a reasonable chance of natural conception. If the DNA fragmentation is normal and their count and motility is low but not so low that they can't do IUI, then they have a reasonable chance of working with IUI. But if the DNA fragmentation is low, then their chances of either natural conception or IUI, where the sperm has to still get to the egg and do its thing, are going to be low. And that's where IVF will give them a higher success rate predicted by the DNA fragmentation, not so much predicted by the morphology. Okay, got it. I hope that was really clear, Danny, and helpful. Um, it would be good to know also why Clomid was the first thing, because it does sound like maybe there's an ovulatory disorder that you're dealing with. Um, but it does sound like the, you know, what we're hearing from Dr. Spitz is that you don't have to worry so much about the morphology. So if ovulation is a bigger challenge, let's tackle that first, and um, and also advocating, you know, eat more veggies. I mean, yeah. really for everybody, right? <laughs> Just yeah, no and, and I just <laughs> and I don't want to. I mean, sometimes a really bad morphology really is telling you something. Right. But I see many couples where the morphology is four percent, five percent, and they're totally normally fertile. If I can see a couple where the morphology is like zero to one percent, okay, th there may well be an issue there. But even then, I will check a DNA fragmentation to really understand what's going on if the other numbers are reasonable. Okay. 
Um, is the DNA fragmentation that you're talking about? So Bar E um, Navarvari uh, said, "How do we figure out if DFI test is required or not? Is that D is, is she talking about the, DNA fragmentation? Yeah, okay. that's the DNA fragmentation. Okay. Yeah. So how do you know if it's required or not? Is it is, is that part of your? That's actually a better question. What's your standard workup look like on the male side? Yeah. So uh, for a couple where they've been failing uh, natural conception um, and the sperm parameters are uh, satisfactory for natural conception, uh, and there's not an obvious female uh, fertility issue, that's a good place to check the DFI, the DNA fragmentation, to see if that's a hidden barrier. Uh, for couples that uh, maybe do have some low, low count, low motility, but um, they have adequate numbers to, to try intrauterine insemination, and they're trying to, to decide between IUI and IVF, DNA fragmentation is helpful there, too, because if it's normal, hey, go for IUI and give it a few tries. Um, for couples who have already tried IUI and have been failing, but the numbers seem okay for IUI, check that DNA fragmentation. See if that's mm -hmm. the reason. So okay. that's how you use it in guiding your decisions. And is that usually something that, I, that you perform, um, everybody needs a good urologist? Is that standard of care uh, at IVF it, clinic? It, it's a semen analysis test that any doctor can order. Many okay. of my referring, many of my referring REI doctors, uh, reproductive endocrinologists, mm -hmm. do uh, order that uh, as they as they see necessary, uh, and I will order it as I see necessary. Okay. Now, not every IVF practice has a urologist as part of the team. I love the IVF practices that do because I feel like it's that extra layer of expertise, right? And mm -hmm. You know, is there, do you see maybe semen analysis coming out of IVF clinics that, um, that maybe need a second set of eyes like yours because they're being misread or maybe honing in on something like morphology that isn't as big of a problem as that a urologist would see? Yeah. I would see that most of the semen analysis are done properly at IVF centers that don't have urologists because it's really a function of their scientists that are mm -hmm. doing it. Where the difference comes in is the interpretation of the results. The results mm -hmm. are sound. It's then uh, how do you interpret what those results are saying? Do you, do you overemphasize morphology or do you underemphasize uh, motility or um, other parameters? It's that interpretation of what does this mean and what, what's the best next step to improve this or what's the best next step to leverage this? Mm -hmm. That's where the urologist can be more helpful. Okay, that makes a ton of sense. And what about a physical exam? You know, I feel like it's so often that women go in for all this testing first when it's kind of a little bit easier for men to check some of those boxes first, you know, than, than for us. Yeah. So what about a physical exam? What are you looking for in a physical exam? So I, I think you're absolutely right. Why not check the semen analysis as soon as possible in a couple that's seeking evaluation for fertility? Uh, it's the least painful of all tests, right? Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> Why we uh, hope? <laughs> uh, so check the semen analysis. And then as far as the physical exam goes, uh, if the semen analysis is completely normal, uh, the physical exam uh, will not typically yield anything that is very concerning or that is life-threatening. So it's not the case that a guy who has a normal semen analysis still needs to see a urologist if they have no other complaints. But... If the semen analysis is abnormal, there are some underlying conditions that could be contributing to it that could also be affecting the man's health and revealing those conditions in the physical examination may be key to then correcting them. So conditions that I'll pick up in a physical examination of the testicle, say, could be a tumor. A testicle mm -hmm. cancer can be subtle when it's first forming not cause pain and not be easily felt, yet causing a significant decrease in sperm count. Wow. But I typically will be able to feel that on an exam, and then I can confirm that with an ultrasound. Another thing that I'll feel on an exam is varicocele. These are in large veins of the testicles, like varicose veins of the legs, only they're in the scrotum and they're varicose veins of the testicles. And what they do is they cause the testicles to be just a little bit too warm. Testicles mm -hmm. hang in the scrotum outside of the inner core of the body because they need to be about two degrees cooler than body temperature, whereas ovaries do not. They are uh, happy at body temperature. That's why they're inside. Varicoceles, excess veins, heat up the testicles just a little too much in some men, not in all, 
Many men have varicose cells and are fertile, but for those that are affected, they're a little too warm, and you feel them as enlarged veins. They have a particular feel and consistency that we call bag of worms, and it's not something you can just see looking at a guy. It's a, it's a, sure. it's a tactile feel. And uh, in many cases, it's just that exam alone that makes that diagnosis. And the treatment of varicoceles, which is typically a, a surgery to block the abnormal veins from continuing to heat up the testicle, can restore normal sperm counts and, for some men that have low testosterone, improve their testosterone if it's from wow. that. Wow, amazing. So these are, these are a couple of conditions. Also, some men have no less deference. They're born without the tube that carries sperm from the testicle into the semen. And there's okay. abso- actually, there's no X-ray, MRI, CT scan that can pick that up because the structure is so small. You can only pick that up from a physical examination. And then once you've made that examination, you understand why the person has no sperm, a very severe situation. And then you can uh, move on with treatment of sperm extraction and IVF without going through a whole lot of unnecessary steps, right. a whole lot of additional testing that you would have been able to understand from that physical exam right off the bat. And then some guys have some breast tissue enlargement, and that's a key thing that's picked up on physical exam that then cues you in that maybe they have a hormonal imbalance accounting for that, Mm -hmm. too low testosterone, too high estrogen. Maybe it's due to a problem uh, in the pituitary gland. There are various and subtle aspects of the physical exam that can lead to a much more rapid diagnosis, more effective treatment, and also ruling out, in in, in occasional cases, life-threatening conditions. We did have, we talked with um, our naturopathic MD actually about men with prolactin and an elevated prolactin and issue with the pituitary gland. So in, is that, is the, the, what lab work do men typically get? You know, we, we talk all about our day three labs all the time about women, right? We talk about our hormones all the time, but um, we sort of, I think people forget, like men need to know the balance between testosterone and estrogen. But outside of like that, Prolactin, do you look at cortisol to like assess the level of stress? What, what other things do you look at from a lab work perspective? Yeah, so the lab work that I typically will use on the hormone evaluation is the testosterone, mm-hmm. the estradiol. Uh, testosterone gets converted to estradiol, and if there's an imbalance, that estradiol, if it gets too high, can have a negative feedback effect on the pituitary gland and suppress the production of the testosterone as well as this production of two other labs that I look for, which is FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, and LH, luteinizing hormone. FSH or follicle. That? Those are two things that we measure in women all the time, and you have to measure those right. in men too. Because men and women are very similar in many ways, hormonally. Uh, so the FSH level uh, is going to stimulate the testicles to make sperm. If the testicles are not able to make enough sperm because they have a, uh, a problem, they were injured, uh, there's a varicocele. Something is preventing the testicles from making normal amounts of sperm inherently. The FSH level will rise to try to stimulate them more and more and more to try to get that sperm level up. And so if you see a high FSH level on your lab panel, you know that there's a problem with the testicles itself. On the other hand, if you see a very low FSH level, there's a problem with it being secreted by the pituitary gland. And that could be a clue that the prolactin is too high because when the prolactin, also made in the pituitary gland, is too high it suppresses the secretion of the FSH and the LH. And so you can do it in a stepwise fashion or you can just do a shotgun approach, which is a little more efficient for many patients who are waiting a long time to get in to be seen and and going back for another lab and back for another lab. So I will just tend to get a a complete profile, which is the testosterone, the estradiol, the FSH, the LH, and the prolactin. And that's the panel that I get. Okay, now... We've we mentioned plant-based foods over and over, but let's talk about antioxidants. We bring up on this show a lot, like, look, you know, get your men checked out. And then the greatest, I think the most efficient thing about the male body is that you get that sperm wash out so frequently. You can see results of positive lifestyle changes, right? So what are some of the Indeed. lifestyle changes, dietary recommendations that you make just to optimize fertility, wellness, which if you optimize fertility wellness, you're opti- optimizing vitality anyway, right? So even yeah. fun things in the bedroom, might, you might have a little bit more vigor in, you know, when it comes to the fun, the fun side of things. So what are some of those changes that you like to, to see your patients adopt? Yes, yeah, so I recommend that they go to a plant-based diet and try to eat uh, primarily or entirely from the produce section. So vegetables, fruits, nuts, beans, whole grains, um, Basically, go to the produce section, and that's 
that's your source of food as much as possible. Because you can go plant-based and be very unhealthy. Uh, oh, donuts, exactly. donuts are plant-based, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> donuts are vegan. You can eat donuts all day long and have a terrible, terrible health. Uh, oh so you God. want to avoid added sugars. You want to avoid processed foods. You want to do whole food, plant-based diet. And if you do eat animal products, eat a lot of plants with them at that same meal mm. because those antioxidants, those, those health, healthful nutrients in the vegetables will play defense against um, wow. you know, the less healthy uh, wow. molecules yeah. in the animal, in the animal-based products. So, so that's the diet recommendations. I also recommend nutri- nutritional supplements for sperm, and there are blends out there. Uh, such as male fertility supplement uh, formulas that IVF clinics will recommend or that you can find online. Mm -hmm. Um, And these are a blend of herbs and vitamins, antioxidants that are all pretty much derived from plants and that you can can mimic to some degree or another with a whole food plant-based diet. Uh, But I think nutritional supplements that also give you an added boost to that are helpful. And then you want to avoid excess heat to the testicles. I explained that they need to be a little bit cooler. Mm. And so you want to avoid getting into a jacuzzi. Okay, do not use a jacuzzi. A jacuzzi will have a negative effect on sperm temporarily. It is temporary. It's not permanent, but it can take up to a couple months for the effect uh, to to go away. All of Hollywood likes us to believe in those romantic moments in the hot tub, right? And That's just right. Say, That's just right. say no to that. Find romance some, somewhere else, not in the jacuzzi, not in the hot tub. So I love that That's advice. Right. There's a great brand out yeah. there that published um, published a little leaflet, you know, don't poke your balls. And I, I, yes. yeah. I love That's right. that. It was so great. Um, That's right. Perfect. That's Super right. Super helpful. You know, this is, um, this is something that, that even talking to my young son, who's only seven, you know, about kind of his hormonal changes through his life that I find so incredibly important to normalize things, nor- normalize automatic directions, you know, ones that he wasn't expecting and it felt uncomfortable to him when they were first happening, right? Like, this is pulling my skin and I don't like how this feels. And, you know, having to have those conversations or when he has a little bit more aggression, like out of left field, and I, I say to him, I think it's a testosterone surge, you're growing, you know, and explaining to him, your penis is going to get longer. Your balls are going to get bigger, you know. And one time he, he even said to me, he's like, I'm becoming a man. I have peach fuzz. <laughs> <laughs> it was so cute. But yeah. I feel like, you know, the, the, the sooner, the earlier, the more frequent we can have these conversations, then the less difficult it becomes when we're in those intimate relationships when, it, when, it, it's a, when we feel ashamed, right? Yeah. You know, well, it you know, just becomes normal. I agree. You know, I have many patients who have read my book, uh, and they are, you know, in their 60s, 70s, 80s, and they all say, I wish I had this book when I was a young man. I wish I had this book at the beginning of all this, not towards the end. And I've had many patients who have given this book to their adolescent children, boys and girls, uh, and have given me tremendously positive feedback that, you know, this is really helpful for them. The book is not written in a couched way. Um, the language in it is not uh, for children, but it's certainly adequate, I think, for adolescents. And, and I do think that the earlier that men and women get this information, um, the more uh, straight and true they can enter into the world of sex and, and reproduction exactly. without myths, uh, without uh, shame, um, mm-hmm. and they can work together better. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think that your book could be the beginning of revolutionizing sex ed class, which I hope so. I hope we can do that for both men and women, that we don't just talk about preventing pregnancy, but we can actually talk about how we can keep our reproductive health healthy, which brings up a couple more questions before we wrap up. One is one of the most popular asked questions around smoking weed. Hmm. So what is the impact to sperm health? You know, it, it, there's a lot of controversy, and the studies themselves uh, raise controversy. I think that it is clear that very heavy marijuana usage, very very chronic usage, um, has a negative effect on fertility, on sexual function, and may even provide some degree of a risk to testis cancer, although, mm. um, you know, the data on that is pretty early. But occasional use... Uh, moderate use, the data is not clear. Mm. Now, smoking smoke <laughs> from burning 
paper right. and leaves is uh, going to have uh, heavy metals in it and, and toxins in it that are just not good for your lungs and for your body. Mm-hmm. But, but the THC effect on fertility when consumed in, in moderate amounts, and do I know what the cutoff for moderate is? I don't. But I would assume it's probably, you know, less than once a week or something. Mm-hmm. I, but I don't know. I don't know what that cutoff is. Does not necessarily correlate to infertility, interestingly. Mm-hmm. And okay. then when you look at alcohol, uh, alcohol seems to settle out somewhere around five alcoholic beverages a week or less being okay for fertility, where, where a fertility effect is not shown in a scientific study. But above that level, a negative effect. Now, this is, this is guidelines for men with normal fertility. If you're a man right. who has poor fertility or barely any sperm, then you don't have the same biological cushion that a guy with 80 million, 100 million sperm with 70% motility has. Right. And so in those cases, I recommend to my patients cutting out any and all toxins to cells, toxins mm-hmm. to the bodies. Because it's not as if marijuana is a nutrient for better fertility, mm-hmm. nor is alcohol. And so if you are really on the edge of, of infertility, I would say cut out those things because you don't have that cushion to absorb whatever effects they may have that aren't easy to see in, in some of these studies that are done on you know normal men. That's super helpful. What about, and somebody's asking us, what about methadone and the impact on sperm? So methadone, as well as narcotics like uh, OxyContin and Vicodin, uh, codeine, these all, over time, suppress the release of FSH and LH mm-hmm. and lower testosterone and, therefore, also, in addition to lowering testosterone, lower sperm production. So men who are on methadone, as well as other chronic opioids that they may require for chronic pain conditions, can be found to have low testosterone and low sperm production. For some of these men, uh, that is reversed by coming off the narcotics. For others, they may need assistance in boosting their hormone production while still needing to stay on their pain medication for their chronic pain condition. And that sometimes can be accomplished with medications like clomiphene citrate, which boosts the FSH and LH signal, or HCG injections, which act as a substitute to the LH signal. And so uh, that, that is uh, a real concern with men on chronic opioids for whatever reason they may require them. Okay, that's, and, and I mean, opioid addiction is such a huge um, challenge for reproductive age men already. Uh, sure. So we, we talk a lot uh, in our community about the benefit of acupuncture with female fertility, not because the studies are cut and dry, they're cut and dry over the, the benefit of using acupuncture for pain, but mostly because we see such a, such a reduction in stress and better outcomes because of the relaxation impact and, and so forth. Uh, do you see the same with male fertility, or have there been you know, studies done about acupuncture and male fertility? So I agree with you that acupuncture, I think, has been demonstrated to improve female fertility in, in certain scenarios. But it has not been demonstrated to improve male fertility no. um, uh, in a clear-cut way. Um, now, is it absolutely the case that it doesn't work on anybody? I don't know. I think, you know, like anything, it may help certain individuals. But across the board, I don't see an obvious, um, obvious evidence that acupuncture helps male fertility. But I do see obvious evidence that it helps female fertility. Okay, great. Um, and Irvine, who asked the question about um, methadone, just wanted to say thank you. She found your answer be very helpful. Uh, last topic before we wrap up, and if anybody else has questions, please keep them coming. And remember, it's a focus on male for, male infertility and male fertility and the, the penis health. So if, if you keep your questions along that line, I'll be back, of course, um, tomorrow afternoon with Dr. Raquel, and you can ask more of the female side questions with our naturopathic MD, Dr. Raquel. So the other, you know, really pressing um, and and very challenging and very heartbreaking situation that we see so much in reproductive age people right now is obesity. And, you know, we we try to counsel our patients, you know, the impact of um, of extra weight on heat, on the the temperature of the the testicles and so forth. But what are some of the other concerns 
you know, with um, with men who are dealing with obesity, and is there sort of a cutoff, you know, of um, like a certain amount of extra weight that's weight and fat, not muscle, um, that is kind of the trigger point to where you start to see those um, those sperm parameters start to decline. Yeah. So obesity can have a negative effect on your hormone balance, and therefore a negative effect on sperm production. Testosterone gets converted to estradiol in the fat, in the abdominal fat, the peripheral fat. And so obese men are at greater risk of having lower levels of testosterone and that negative feedback of estradiol on their pituitary, suppressing their FSH and LH secretion, which is important for their sperm production. The, the BMI, body mass index, at which that tipping point occurs is, I don't think, known. Uh, but mm. I have had patients who are very obese with no or little sperm production show a marked improvement in their sperm production after significant weight loss. So it does play a role. There is a cause and effect, but it, that may not be the cause for male infertility, but it could be. And it certainly should be a part of the solution. Uh, going for a lean body mass coupled with proper uh, eating strategy, which is a whole food plant-based diet, which fortunately helps achieve a lean body mass, Mm -hmm. Um, and optimizing hormones. For some men who are obese, they have difficulty losing that weight because their testosterone is low. And helping them lose weight may involve boosting their testosterone, but not not giving them testosterone shots or or right. testosterone gels, because that shuts off sperm production. But using right. other strategies like Clomid, clomiphene mm. citrate, or, or HCG. Okay, got it. This is a great question. OC Fertility asked to find significant weight loss. You know, are we talking about someone who's 300 pounds, who can lose 100 pounds to 200, somebody who's 400, yes. who has to lose. Yeah, it's, it's that's significant. significant. Like yeah, that. not losing 10 or 20, but losing yeah. you know, 40, 40 or 60 or 100. Yeah, that's right. Okay, significant. All right, that is super helpful. Um, let's, so remind us the full title of your book. I just I'm always going to forever remember the penis book, but yeah. there's a complete title. <laughs> if I recall it correctly, <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> uh, the penis book: A Doctor's Guide to Size, Function, and Everything in Between. Yeah, it's such a great title. I mean, and I do just want to reiterate how much I love kind of the intro, um, the very first page. You know, to all those who have a penis, and all those who know someone who has a penis. I think that that's fantastic. It's a must read, I think, for everyone. We should all know, um, you know, uh, each other's reproductive health. I think that that's really why we need to revolutionize sex ed, right. you know, so that, that these and, things and, are, uh, are not happening. What to better talk about. The stuff a stocking than yeah. stuck a stuffing than stuck a sto- stuff a stocking than the stuff penis book. <laughs> I completely agree with that. I completely agree with that. So I definitely know that I'm sending my own father. Oh, is that what that word is? I can see it. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh no, Perfect. no, I was. What was it? I accidentally flipped my. Uh, here we go. There it is. Oh yeah, there it is. There it is. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's probably reversed. It has it has an eggplant though, which we almost used in our our email yeah. blast. Um, um, let's wrap up with just is there uh? a BMI level to shoot for? Well, I mean, you want to stay below the uh, obesity threshold, um, certainly. And so um, if I'm remembering correctly, it's probably, you know, 25 uh, or less. Un- under the overweight threshold. I mean, ideally, you want to just be at a normal body mass. Yeah. And I okay. believe that's around. But, you know, again, any, any improvement you can get is helpful. I'm not saying right. if, you can't, if you can't get to a lean body mass, forget it. That's not the case at all. I mean, right. even incremental changes in conjunction with a better diet, in conjunction with decreased alcohol, yeah. stopping smoking. I have, yeah. I've, I've had patients who are obese. They smoke, they drink. I mean, they're just a wreck. Right. And they get, they get it together and they show up later and they're normally fertile. I mean, it, it, sometimes, it's, sometimes it amazes me, honestly, what oh, the body great. can do, how the body can recover. Oh, that's great. One of, one of the doctors that has, is using the book for her patients says she really likes the chapter on lifestyle, chapter 14 or 15. And we talk a lot about lifestyle on this show and in our community because it is, it's been hard this year to eat plant-based, right, in the pandemic. Yeah. I mean, we've all... Um, had our comfort foods, and, um, and and sometimes it's been hard to access fresh. Um, fresh yeah, we vegetables. take we take a lot of uh, take a lot of COVID privilege with yes. those snacks. It's COVID. <laughs> I have to eat these M&Ms. It's, exactly. it's COVID. You know. 
well, that's that's yeah. what COVID got me on the Peloton every single day. So thanks, COVID. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Well, that's the nice thing about about. I mean, the silver lining is. I mean, make no mistake, COVID is is a severe uh, hardship for so many people, and for so many people, it really is yeah. about survival. Yeah. Uh, but absolutely. but for some people, uh, for some more fortunate amongst us, uh, it has given them time to stop and focus on self-care, right? That's 100%. And, yeah. And self-care includes uh, mind and body wellness. And, and the mind is a very important part of, of overall wellness. And something that I didn't address but I'll, I'll maybe insert here is that uh, meditation mm-hmm. and mindfulness and practicing uh, meditation, being in the moment, is, uh, I think, a very effective strategy for reducing stress, for improving right. health. Uh, I think it's a good strategy for sexual wellness. Uh, it certainly can't hurt for fertility. And it also helps with just getting through uh, the stresses and challenges mentally and physically of the day. And so adopting a regular routine, I would say 15 minutes or more daily, mm-hmm. just like you would groom in the morning, just like you would um, uh, you know, attend to any of your daily routines that are required, make this a required part of your routine, I think it will pay great dividends. Oh, I love that advice. And if you're part of the Fertility Answers app, we do have a recommended free fertility meditation app. I love the idea of, of having that be part of couplehood. Um, I think that there is um, there's a lot to be said for, for trying to take it on as a couple, right, to keep it um, keep each other accountable. I've tried to incorporate the same with my child, so I let him hear my live meditations when I'm doing them, and nobody's allowed to interrupt me, but I want him to hear them. So come on to the Fertility Answers app. Everyone will get matched to that recommendation, um, and you know you can always ask more questions on the iOS and Android app. Dr. Spitz, you're such a joy. I've, I could talk to you for hours.